And um, John 9.25 is a verse I learned many years ago. And that was, uh, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, before I was blind, and now I can see. And I wouldn't have said that 50 years ago, but looking back now, I would say that is my testimony in a nutshell. Before meeting Jesus, um, I had no idea. No idea why are we here, why am I here, what's the point? I just, life made no sense whatsoever. I just kept myself busy. Um, but since meeting Jesus, I could see. And this chapter 9 is all about one man's experience, his life being changed by the Lord, and he's being asked to give an account for what had happened to him. And three times he shares the same story, and he, and he gets more and more bold in uh, his account. But the story doesn't change. So, in this chapter, Jesus repeats the claim, I am the light of the world. And to quote the, the song from uh, the American country western, there are none so blind as that none will not see. Uh, Glenn, Glenn sorry, Campbell? Glenn Campbell. Yeah. There are none so blind as them that will not see. And that's really the theme of this uh, chapter today. So let's kick off. Jesus is walking through Jerusalem. And he, uh, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who'd been blind from birth. No doubt by now he's totally dependent and a beggar. Rabbi, the disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins? Pretty soon he hadn't done anything yet, he was born blind. Or his parents' sin? And look at the thinking behind that. It's probably a very Jewish way to think, but uh, I think we all do. Why does God allow suffering? Maybe it's some form of punishment for doing the wrong thing. So you sort of have this built-in thing that the universe is a moral place. And uh, uh, we get what we deserve, karma. You know, good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. So the disciples asked Jesus, well, why is this man born blind? We don't know how old he was, but I imagine fairly old. And so Jesus gives, so whose fault is this? And I, look, I get that a lot today, don't we, about why does God allow suffering? And there's no simple answer to that one. Okay. Uh, mostly, we are the ones who screwed up. And every time you and I spend a lot of time weeding our gardens, I, I curse Adam. It's his fault, right? The sweat of our brow from now on. Anyway, so whose fault is it? Mostly it's our fault. Sin has had all kinds of terrible results. And yes, God is allowing the two to coexist, but that's a whole other story. All right. So Jesus says, it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This has happened so the power of God could be seen in him. And I wrote at the bottom. So watch this. We must quickly carry out the works, tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming when no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world and I am going to work. This man needs light. He has never understood colour. I'm going to give it to him. My abuse of that verse is night comes when no one can work. You know, it's dark, it's winter, it's after six o'clock and I just want to curl up and put on my jammies and watch TV and forget everything, okay? Uh, that's the lazy application of night comes when no one can work. That's obviously not what Jesus is saying, yeah? He's saying, while I have opportunity to do good, I will do good. The time will come when I won't have this opportunity. So now is the time. So guys, watch this. Now, 
Here's my more serious application of night comes when no one can work. I used to say, as long as I can walk and talk, I'll keep on teaching. Well, as you can see now, walking is no longer much of an option for me, but I can still talk. So, Lord, as long as I have the capacity to talk intelligently, uh, I'll keep on serving you and, and teaching and sharing my brothers and sisters. Maybe the time is coming and my marbles will be uh, loose and lost and maybe I won't be able to. But until that day, I will keep on serving the Lord. The night is coming and I won't be able to serve God. But in the meantime, I can. So one attitude, that's good enough for me. All right. Now, Jesus is going to heal this bloke. And it's a bit unusual. I'm going to contrast with Bartimaeus. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, we know Bartimaeus is in uh, Jericho. Jesus is walking through. Son of David, have mercy on me. And everyone's telling him, shut up, shh. Jesus is busy. And he calls out, he calls out, he calls out. And the Lord says, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus says, let me see. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. See. He just spoke the word, and the man could see. Bartimaeus called out in faith. This guy didn't have to do that. <coughs> Jesus gets down his level. He spit on the ground, made mud from the saliva, with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sin. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Did this man exercise faith? He didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus puts some mud things like, hey, what are you up to? What are you, who are you? What's going on? And Jesus said, go wash your face. He didn't say, and then you will see. But the guy must have understood this is an unusual request. And he trusted Jesus and he went and he washed. Now imagine he didn't walk on his own to the pool of Siloam. Okay. And he'd been feeling around, people might have helped him along. And imagine, what's this about? What's this about? And he washes and he opens his eyes and there's colour. There are people would have been absolutely amazing. And so he comes back to where his usual begging spot was. Well, needless to say, this is going to draw a crowd, but that took faith. It took faith to, okay, you said it, Lord, I'll do it. And, and notice, one time Jesus spoke the word, this time he made mud and put on the guy's eyes, he used different methods. I worry about people saying, oh, this is the way Jesus did it, this is the way it's got to be done. You know, read a different story, you'll see a different way he did it. Okay, so <coughs> let's not be mudites, spitites, or, you know, just say the wordites, etc. Okay, here we go. His neighbours and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit in bed? Some said he was, others said, no, nah, he just looks like him. Oh. It, well, he's not blind now, so it can't be him, right? I mean, this is just too big a change. And the beggar kept saying, yeah, I'm the man, I'm the same one, it's me, it's me. They asked, who healed you? What happened? Please explain. And so sure enough, he told them. The man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go and wash in the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed and now I can see. That's all I know. And that's what's happened. Uh, so Jesus is the one and here's what happened. What's their response? Well, where is he now? This is a a good side show, we were as good as it's about. I don't know, he replied. I don't know. As a young Christian, 
Try to explain your experience and your faith. It's okay to say, I don't know. You do not have to have all the answers to all the questions before you're qualified to speak. Just say what you do know. Uh, I made a promise to myself as a young believer never to be caught without an answer to the same question twice. When somebody stumped me on that one, I go to my spiritual dad, hey, how do you answer that? And he give me a couple of verses. Oh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I go, great. So people run out of questions that would stop me. Okay? However. So the report gets escalated. They said, well, okay. Uh, and they took the man who had been, or been blind to the Pharisees. Because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. You understand what I mean by escalated? You ring the energy company and you complain and I want to talk to your manager. He gets escalated up a level. So here are the neighbors who you know try and deal with this. Well, the Pharisees, they'll know how to deal with this. They said, you should go talk to a Pharisee. Um, that happened on the Sabbath. Jesus had a habit of doing things on the Sabbath. Was it intentional? to stir the pot, to stir the Pharisees. I think so, it's only one day out of seven. The Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them. He put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Look, that's the second time he shared the same story. I don't understand it, but this is what happened. So he shares the same thing again. What's their response? They won't believe him. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God. Why? For he's working on the Sabbath. He's breaking our precious rules. Okay? Men of God don't break our rules. <clears throat> yeah. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Them being the Pharisees. Some of them started to say, no, this, there's no other explanation. This is the power of God. And others say, no, 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 this doesn't fit in my little theological box and it's not acceptable. So they start to argue. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been healed and demanded, what's your opinion? As if his opinion would matter to them. But they're so frustrated, no answers. What do you reckon? about the man who healed you. Well, what does he know? His answer is, well, uh, oh yes, before I do that, I want to share cross-reference from Acts chapter 4. The Pharisees did not want to accept Jesus as being from God. But here's this man born blind, now seeing by the hand of Jesus and they didn't want to accept it. Didn't want to believe it. It was a very inconvenient fact that this man is now healed. And it reminded me of an episode in Acts chapter 4 when Peter and John raised a, a man who had been lame and was now walking in the temple place. Members of the council, and so they, they drag in Peter and John, please explain. And uh, members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. Where did this, these fishermen have such a knowledge of the scriptures? I mean, what is this? They also recognized that these men who had been with Jesus. Oh, that's where they got it from. But seeing the man, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing they could say. How inconvenient. What a pity. What a pain. And how do you argue with that? Clearly a miraculous work has been done, but we did not want to acknowledge it. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't let them have before, 
We can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. Oh, yeah. Uh, they are on thin ice and they knew it. And so they thought they'd gotten rid of Jesus and all these miraculous signs were over, but now Peter, James and John and other Jesus' disciples were doing the same kind of miraculous signs. Uh, this is not going to go away. Um, I'm afraid religious education for Jews ever since has been denying that Jesus is Messiah. I'll call that an inconvenient truth or fact. You can have all kinds of theories about all kinds of things, but if the evidence contradicts it, your theory is rubbish. The evidence contradicted their claim that Jesus was not from God. So the evidence was not welcome. Right? We can be pretty stubborn about that. In the human heart. Okay, back to this. Damn it, one more time. The men replied, or the man replied, I think he must be a prophet. And that was enough. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been born blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? Please confirm or deny. No, clutching at straws. So what do they do? They, they chickened out. They said, his parents replied, we know this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. We've been dealing with him all his life. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. They weren't there. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. We don't want to get involved. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who would announce that anyone saying Jesus was Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's called an abuse of power. That's why they said, he's old enough, ask him. Keep us out of it. When I became a believer, and I told my parents I was now a Christian, they were very embarrassed. Because in their eyes, I was always a Christian. I was baptized as a Christian as a baby. You're Greek, of course you're a Christian. So it was very embarrassing for them. <coughs> Acknowledge that I've found this new faith. At our wedding, I testified to the Lord in front of about 250 guests. And my parents were embarrassed about that too, but they didn't enter into any conversations about it. And I've said. So for the second time, they called in the man who'd been born blind and told him. God should get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. At least I didn't ask him to tell his story again. And he Andrew said, I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. And Jesus did it. Underline, you draw your own conclusions. Yeah? But you can see he's kind of getting a bit sick of this and starting to bite back at the Pharisees. You're pretty threatening, I'm sure. I know what I know. And this is my story. That's the great thing about having a testimony. You share your experience and no one can say, oh, you're, that's wrong. No. You're crazy. That didn't happen to you. You know what happened, you just tell it like it is. Now, I said at the beginning, yes, I could testify, I was blind and now I see. I didn't know that at the time. I can look back at it and see that, yes, that's what has happened to me. But we all have different stories, other possible testimonies of contrast. It might have been, I felt alone in the world yeah, I had family and friends, but my core, alone and empty. Now I say, I feel the presence of God. 
That's a contrast, a story worth telling. Or uh, I was overcome by a sense of guilt. And uh, all the counseling in the world couldn't deal with it, okay? Well, now I've met Jesus, I have an assurance of forgiveness. I met with a guy called Michael who had become a Christian through our church a number of years ago. And one time we were sitting at the QV coffee shop and Michael said, I feel clean. And that's, that was new to him. Great. Fantastic. Well, maybe a lack of purpose. I talked about that, that last week. I didn't know why I was here, where I was going. And now I can bring glory to God as I obey him and fulfill his purposes for my life. That's a contrast. Well, I used to be angry at people, very cynical, and now God's given me a love for people. Now, I share in my testimony, I thought I loved other people. One day God opened my eyes, and I realized I only loved others when I got something out of it. So, Constant, who do you really love? I love myself. And that really whew, struck me. Well, now God has given me a love for others. Or, Fear of the future. Now I have the confidence that God is in control. Um, I know not what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. You know, that sort of an attitude. Or maybe fear of death. And now the total assurance self of salvation. When I die, you guys throw a party, I've gone to a better place. Okay? There are many different testimonies, many different contrasts. I encourage each of you to think through, well, what's the biggest difference or differences that God has made in my life through coming into a relationship with Him? I have reduced my testimony to four words. Lost, light. Lust, love. That's my testimony in four words. The difference that Jesus has made in my life. So this guy had a far simpler, uh, even, well, might seem more dramatic, it's something physical and visible, but uh, I was blind, now I can see. But you all have a testimony. It doesn't have to be, I was a drug-pushing Satanist priest, and now I love Jesus. I mean, you know, it sounds dramatic, it's wonderful, wow, people want to hear all about that, you know, chopping off your fingers and stuff, but that, uh, not all of us have that sort of dramatic testimony. And that's okay. In fact, God kept you from becoming a drug pushing Satanist, <laughs> whatnot, uh, is power enough. Okay? You had enough opportunity, perhaps. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so these guys were frustrated gluttons of punishment, the Pharisees. But what did he do, they asked? How did he heal you? They wanted to hear it. He only had one story. Put mud on my eyes, told me to watch, came back, I can see. And so, look, the man exclaimed, I told you once, and you didn't listen. Do I have to tell you again? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Oh, he pressed their buttons with that one. He really did. Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't know where this man comes from. Well, that had been the theme of quite a few earlier chapters. And where do you come from? Who's your daddy? Uh, Etc. Right? So they were, and they said last chapter, "Oh, this crowd is cursed. They're ignorant." So for being shepherds for the flock, they didn't sort of care much for them, did they? And now here, well, they cursed him. And, uh, you're not the real deal. So here's their attitude. They were kind of, <coughs> we've seen that picture before. What's going on? This is not working out well, working out well for us. 
Pharisees were getting more and more perplexed about what to do about Jesus and the evidence that he left. So, the man turns it up again. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. You're saying he's a sinner? But if this, this is obviously a work of God, I mean, uh, God doesn't listen to sinners. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. But he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, none has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. Come on, guys, think about it. Be honest. Uh, the evidence suggests 100% that Jesus is from God. Let's have a look at that. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. Got a couple of Psalms here. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. I understood that. And look, we all have sin in our heart. And God knows that we are but dust. And he still graciously listens. But if I cherish sin, love it, treasure it, pamper to it, and let it be my master, God says, well, why should I hear your prayers? You don't love me. You love the world. And in Isaiah 59, the Lord's hand is not so short that he cannot say, or his ear so impaired that he cannot hear. But your sin has made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Pretty scary verses, isn't it? But God is saying, you don't listen to me at all. What makes you think I should listen to you? There's no relationship. I'm not stupid. Um, um, uh, Dylan's song came to mind, but he's not my servant. He's not my errand boy to satisfy my, satisfy my wandering desires. I think my older brother, my only brother, uh, sort of thinks that, well, if I need God, I'll call that and he'll listen then. Uh, maybe an example is this. If a total stranger comes up the street and asks me for a lender 50 bucks, am I likely to give it to him? No. If one of you comes to me and asks me for 50 bucks, am I likely to give it to you? If I have it, I'll give it. What's the difference? Relationship is the difference. So, we're all children of God, and yes, we all have periods where we're not listening and we're being stubborn children. His grace and His mercy, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end, and you every morning, great is our faithfulness. What a wonderful promise to fall back on. But for those who have a lifetime habit of ignoring God or ridiculing him or Stephen Fry, calling him a maniac, uh, well, one day when they call out to God, what basis do they have to expect that God would listen? They'll be reaping what they sow. No, sorry. Yeah, he doesn't listen to sinners. But he does listen to us. All right. That's enough. Now the expression of the Pharisee's face is quite different. Thank you very much. You were born a total sinner. Whew. Heavy, heavy label, isn't it? They answered, are you trying to teach us? Give me a break. And they threw him out of the synagogue. Um, they hadn't resolved anything. Uh, except they were proving that they were not going to give Jesus one inch of credibility, despite this evidence that was undeniable. 
So I threw him out. What does this guy do? He goes, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Remember, believe is always in blue. Now, remember, this guy had never seen Jesus before. Probably recognised the voice. But you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. He was a hungry heart. He listened to these Pharisees who were blind guides. There's <laughs> the pun, who was blind. Um, he wanted truth you have seen him Jesus said and he is speaking to you right now it's me yes Lord I believe he said and he worshipped Jesus and Jesus didn't say anything but he accepted the worship. If Jesus was not God, what should he have done? Whoa, brother, stop. You're confused. Stand up. No, 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 no. That's not the point. You don't worship me. You worship the Father. But Jesus, like you said with Peter, like you said with Thomas later, blessed are you if you believed. That's right, son. His right to worship me. No flesh and blood can, would comfortably accept that. And how do you feel if I went up to you, Jim, and said, Jim, I worship you? I mean, it's a pretty big boot. I think it put to effect, a uh, good effect, pretty quickly. Yeah. Jesus accepted it. And it just so happens the chapter isn't over. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Now some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him say that, are you saying that we're blind? We've been respected to the community ever since we graduated from Pharisee school, we get the top place at the synagogues and the festivals, whatever. Everyone acknowledges us as, you know, you the man. Now you're saying that we are blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Because you think you've got it all, uh, you are indeed blind. And it, now, that's a bit figurative. It made me think of a verse that the same truth, a bit clearer. Not clearer, but obvious. Um, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus said, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Brackets to repentance. If you are self righteous, which is the Pharisees' biggest problem, okay, all this knowledge led to all this arrogance and self righteousness, um, those who don't think they have any problem with sin will never call out for a Savior. Only those who acknowledge I have a problem with sin. I am broken. I am not good enough for God. My life is empty. I need God. They are the ones who when they hear about Jesus will say, yes, this is what I've been looking for all this time. They are the ones who will repent and believe. It's like Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into heaven because rich people are often very self-satisfied. And you need to know that you have a need before you can begin to look towards the heavens. Put that another way. So, therefore, my beloved brethren, what can I say? Oops. How freely do you share about your encounter with Jesus to others? This guy was happy to 
He would tell his story. We all should be happy and privileged and keen to share our story with others. Have a think about your testimony. And, you know, we've talked about that in the past, okay? But how could you relate that so that it's simple and clear and effective? And maybe part of that, what's your equivalent to once I was blind, now I can see? What would you say is the difference that Jesus has made in your life? Okay. We'll close in prayer, and then we have two things to do. Uh, yeah, we'll close in prayer first. Father, we just want to thank you. Lord Jesus, you have the power to heal and to change lives. Lord, just not just physical healing, but emotional and social and spiritual healing. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who needs your touch of healing, that they would call out to you and uh, experience you drawing close to them and working in their lives. Father, thank you that once we were blind, but now we can see, we know that Jesus lifted up his our salvation. The resurrection is true. And Lord, your promises are there for us to claim and to make our own. So Father, help us to experience you at that deep and personal level. Lord, we just uh, thank you for your revealing yourself to us through your word each and every week. And Lord, I hope and trust each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name.